I'm very, very, very happy to be here. It's my first time in, in Moscow and it's an amazing city, so very, very happy. It's very, very beautiful. Um, my name is Tobias. Um, first of all, if you have any questions after this talk or during the rest of the conference or in 17 weeks, please hit me up on Twitter or via my email address. I'll always try to reply to you and answer because I care about making websites faster and if you just have any questions about image optimization or front-end performance in general, hit me up. That's me. Also, you might have noticed by my accent by now, I'm German. So if you find this presentation both highly efficient and humorless, I apologize. Um, second of all, uh, I know we've been uh, sitting here for a while, so I have a request that both involves you moving and me becoming a better presenter. And that is, I do tend to speed up a lot when I get nervous, so I speak very fast and that's a problem for everybody listening. So if you notice that I'm speeding up and speeding up and you have trouble understanding me, do this. <sighs> Slow down, dude. Okay? So whenever you feel like you have no idea what I'm talking about, lift your arms and do that. And I'll immediately try to slow down and I'll buy you a beer after, okay? Cool. Thank you very much. So I work for a small company um, called Akamai Technologies. Um, they uh, consider themselves the uh, biggest company nobody has heard of, which is fun and also sadly true. Um, because we mostly work behind the scenes, so we don't sell anything to end consumers. We only do business to business. Um, that little bit of traffic that we generate by doing business to business is about one third of the world's internet traffic on a day to day basis. So that's pretty neat. So as soon as you do any kind of significant performance change on the Akamai platform, this has an immediate impact, which is an awesome place to work. Um, specifically, specifically for my team, that means <coughs> Um, I am part of a team that is called Advanced Solution Services, and that means we are right down in the mud. We try to make the platform, the Akamai platform, do stuff that it wasn't built for sometimes. We try to build custom solutions for very large customers that have interesting problems. So it's a very engineering job and down and dirty, and I love doing that. Um, part of it is also speaking at conferences, by the way. And uh, so as part of that job, I have dabbled with image optimization for the last now four and a half, going on five years. Uh, mostly spent my time with lossy encoding because that's far more interesting and far more revealing. And uh, I've come up with a couple of nice solutions today. Um, so what I'm trying to show you today is how to make your images load faster than ever and how to start rendering image contents with only 25% of the image data being sent. That sounds pretty cool, huh? So now, before you start throwing heavy things at me and calling me a snake oil salesman and booing me off the stage, please let me try to show you some data to prove my point that this is possible. First of all, we have a problem with images, the problem that I'm trying to solve with you today. The problem is that images are getting bigger and bigger. These are graphs from the HTTP archive by Steve Souders. It tracks um, how the average website develops over time. So right now, I think the HTTP archive tracks about 1.5 million websites and publishes a report on, this, on the statistics of these websites bi-monthly, so twice a month. Um, as you can see in the graphs, images currently make up about 64% of all image data, of all website data being sent by the average website. These uh, statistics you see are for the Alexa top 1000. And also you can see in the other cake diagram that JPEGs are about half of all of that. So if we want to fix our image problem, we should probably focus on JPEGs first. Why should we focus? Because you can see that in the bottom graph, because images have a very high correlation to page load time and the speed index. Who of you knows what the speed index is? All right, I'm glad I put an introduction into the slides for that later. Okay, page load time is kind of clear, yeah? It means how, how long the site takes to load because that's in the name. So when the site finishes loading, that's page load time. So images have a very high correlation to that. That means the more image data, the slower the site loads. Kind of obvious, you know? Put a lot of heavy stuff in your backpack, you walk slower. That's basically what's happening here. Also, the problem is a little uh, com more complicated because images also tend to grow ever and ever bigger. Uh, here we see the statistics for the last two years. And as you can see, images tend to grow 200 kilobytes per year, year over year. Um, the amount of images, funnily enough, stays the same almost. 
That means um, we don't have initial HTTP requests or something, but our image data gets bigger. The reason being because nowadays we have to deal with high, high DPI devices like smartphones or the newest MacBooks. Uh, we also have to deal with the hero image trend, which means putting a very, very big image at the top of your website. And generally, people are fond of images. I mean, who of you has not ever uploaded an image to the internet? I thought as much, right? So images are something lovely. We all love them. So images are important, but we have a problem with their growth. So now that we know the problem, the problem is images getting bigger and bigger, curious monkeys that we all are, what can we do? So we can get compressing. That means we can try to make those images smaller. How can we do that? We can try to compress aggressively. That means lossily without causing the image to look very, very bad. For JPEGs, like I showed you, the ones that are most predominant in the image format world right now, that means uh, taking, uh, leveraging one of, the most, uh, JPEG, one of the best JPEG encoders, and that is currently Mods JPEG. Mods JPEG has been developed, as the name suggests, by Mozilla, but is backed by companies uh, like Facebook and also Akamai. Um, so Mods JPEG is a JPEG encoder that was created because people thought JPEG can do everything that we need a modern J image format to, to do, like WebP and JPEG XR tried to promise us in 2012, but we need a better encoder. So companies got together, they built that encoder, and that encoder is better than any other JPEG encoder we currently have. So first takeaway of the day, if you want to compress JPEGs in the future, please check out Mods JPEG. It's open source, it's on GitHub, it's amazing. Mods JPEG. Second of all, because we need to tackle the problem like I just mentioned, we need to ship the right format. So there are good and bad image formats for certain scenarios. So if you have a full color image, that means a photo like this one, that means you should uh, select a format that is appropriate. If you would select a PNG 24 for this one, the image would be huge and your users would be really, really upset. So don't do that. You need to pick a format that is appropriate for, this, for the scenario that you have. In this case, for a photo, a scenario would be JPEG, or for Chrome or Blink-based browsers, WebP maybe, and also JPEG XR for modern Internet Explorer 11 and Edge browser. These are three valid formats for full color images. So selecting the right format for the appropriate scenario is also important to ship image data with as, le with as least bytes as possible. And last but not least, Consider automating the image quality. Let me, so let me ask it, um, who of you has compressed JPEGs in the past? Cool. Have you considered um, putting a certain quality parameter in like 85 or 82, 75? Thank you. The problem with that is that depending on the image contents, the number that you put into a JPEG encoder might be good or bad, depending on what kind of stuff is in the image. For example, an image that has a lot of red in it will cause larger images than an image that is full of blue colors. An image that has high contrast corners and high fidelity, for example, a macro photo of this beautiful carpet, would create a larger image than a very blurry background smooth photo. The reason for that is that the JPEG encoder has certain opinions about how to compress certain things. And so what we need to do is we need to find an algorithm that is able to, uh, to understand what is a good setting for each input image. The tool of choice here would be the Structural Similarity Index. Uh, there's an acronym for it, it's SSIM. There are uh, certain implementations of it. The best one I've seen so far is by Corner Lisinski, creator of Image Optim. It's called DSSIM, the Dissimilarity Index. With this beautiful piece of algorithmic math, what you can do is you can find out um, how much an image has changed after compression. So you can find out, does this image now contain 5% of changes or 20% of changed blocks? So as you can see in this slide, there are pixels that are highlighted, and those are the pixels that have been touched by the JPEG encoder. Um, so we can now try to aim for a certain number of change percentage, which is acceptable. So now the question is, of course, what is acceptable? And we found out that about a percent of change is acceptable. It means if an image is, n is still after a compression, 99% similar to the input image, it's completely okay. 
So ModsJPEG in combination with DSSIM is an awesome tool you can use to automate the JPEG quality for encoding and get JPEGs as small as possible without ever having to think about JPEG quality again. At the end of the day, however, even if you did all these stuff, these things that I just mentioned, this is still a very heavy load to ship. So at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, I thought we need a more aggressive way of image delivery. And then I started reading up about HTTP2. And I thought, hey, that's cool. I already have the tool in place. HTTP2 is up and coming. And the tool I'm going to talk about now is multiplexing. HTTP2 multiplexing. So HTTP1 has been around for a very, very long time. And by now, it tastes kind of boring and bland. Yes, it's licorice, it's tasty, but it's just not as good as the new HTTP2. HTTP2 can deliver far more tastiness in, a, in the same amount of time, which is awesome. If you're not into candy or licorice, here's a more technical diagram. At the top, you see how HTTP 1 behaves. It has a request and a response, a request and a response, and everything is daisy-chained, which means everything is slow. HTTP 2, and the magic that is called multiplexing, initiates all requests at the same time. So HTTP requests, uh, requests for objects inside your page, CSS, JavaScript, images, can all start at the same time. So no more waterfall diagrams like I'm going to show you soon. Another important aspect of HTTP2 is that we can set priorities, which of course gives us a lot of power and with power comes responsibility. So tread carefully here. But HTTP2 enables us as developers to set flags on certain objects and tell the browser that this certain object is more important than another object. So no more high load order optimization inside an HTML file. You can set that server side. Very cool. And I'm going to make use of that later in my demo of how to load images faster with this. This is the waterfall diagram that I just mentioned. Waterfall diagrams are, can show you how assets inside a web page load. Um, who of you knows what web page test is? OK, great. So I'm going to evangelize about that. Web page test is de facto the standard testing tool for synthetic, that means machine testing, of website performance. It's webpagetest.org. Everybody note that down. It's probably the best tool you will take out of this talk today, aside from what's JPEG. Webpagetest.org. It's the standard tool. So whenever somebody in the web performance community says, this site is bad, they always provide a link to the web page test instance they ran because it's like the standard, the de facto standard, although it hasn't been standardized by the IETF or something. So web page test enables you to test performance with real browsers from all over the world and get back the performance metrics in beautiful diagrams. And it's for free. So um, Akamai, for example, provides an API key for 200 tests per day. Um, and you can even automate that. So you can put the web page test in your command line and write a script for it so whenever you deploy, you can get a no nice performance test for your most recent deployment. So it's pretty cool. So that's web page test. What we see here is Chrome um, for a slave by web page test, and it's testing a demo site that I've built. This demo site contains a simple HTML file that only layouts a grid and then 20 JPEGs. Uh, these 20 JPEGs are a little bigger because I want to make sure that when I now do optimizations, um, that I see numbers that are significant enough for you to, to visualize them in graphs. So at the left-hand side, you see HTTP1, so the old HTTP protocol that was used until recently or is also still in use in a lot of websites. And you see that Chrome having a default setting of six simultaneous connections. That means it's able to download six objects simultaneously creates this waterfall diagram, this step ladder. And as you can see, the lower the ladder gets, the later the images start downloading. That means at the beginning, the browser, Chrome, requests the HTML, the couple of images, about four or five at the start, and then another two after one or two have started downloading, and then another couple, and then another couple, which means the images number 16, 17, 18, and 19 basically start, I don't know, four seconds later than the rest, which is really bad. That means they, they, are, they come later into the user's view. This is something I want to fix with you today. On the other side, you see how Chrome would behave with HTTP2. HTTP2's multiplexing starts all connections simultaneously, and all the images start downloading at the same time. That means the, uh, image, uh, the images show up faster, which is awesome for the user experience, because the user gets to see image contents sooner. 
Um, there are, of course, a couple of problems with that. For example, HTTP2 has a problem with the initial congestion window of TCP, but these are things we are fixing, or the Akamai platform has fixed them, Facebook has fixed them, Google has fixed them. Um, if you want to deploy everything yourself, this is something you would need to fix yourself. But the documentation on that is up and coming. HTTP2 had a couple of how shall I say, adoption problems, but it's getting better and better. So the, the problems that we found with HTTP2 a year ago are, no, are problems no longer. So it's safe to, to deploy HTTP2 today. So that was my story about HTTP2's multiplexing. This is important to remember to understand the rest of what I'm going to show you. So initializing image downloads simultaneously, HTTP2's multiplexing. The second ingredient that I want to show to you today are progressive JPEGs. Progressive JPEGs are a special way of encoding JPEGs. Here is what a progressive JPEG is versus the standard sequential JPEG. A sequential JPEG loads like a window blind effect from top to bottom, rendering line by line, boring and not very engaging, and you have no idea what's going on until the entire image is downloaded. That's also a problem for your browser, because until the entire image is downloaded, the browser has no idea how big that image is going to be. That means reflow, 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 reflow in the browser, which is costly on CPU and GPU. That's a problem. Progressive JPEGs utilize something that is called scan layers. And that means that they have a very rough resolution at the beginning, and then they get better and better, ever, ever higher in resolution, until the image is completely downloaded and visible in all its beauty. That means that the browser knows sooner how big the entire image is going to be. And it means that your users get an initial impression about the image contents much sooner than they would do with sequential JPEGs, which is important for the user experience. There is also the additional benefit, which is basically one of the key components of that whole thing I'm going to show you today, that with HTTP 2's multiplexing, we are able to download those initial scan layers sooner. So scan layers, I've mentioned them now. Here you can see a photo of the River Rhine flowing through the beautiful city of Düsseldorf, Germany, where I come from. And the left-hand side, the pixelated thing, is scan layer number one of the Rhine photo that I took. In the middle, it's scan layer number five. You can identify it only by the green in the meadow not being quite as green as it should be. And on the right-hand side, it's scan layer number 10. That's the full resolution image. And here are all 10 scan layers. And this, important note, is the default configuration when you encode a JPEG. So when you encode a progressive JPEG, it is defined by the standard that there shall be 10 scan layers, unless the JPEG encoder is really, really weird. But I don't think there's anyone out there that I know of that does something else. So per default, when you create a progressive JPEG, and for example, Mod JPEG will always create a progressive JPEG, unless you tell it otherwise, because it's important for the user experience, you will always have 10 scan layers. With the River Rhine photo that I'm showing you here, you can see that the initial scan layer here is even black and white, so not a lot of visual information for the user, and it's pixelated. In the second scan layer, so in the scan layer number two, you can see that the Rhine is purple, which is really, really weird. Why? Because certain color information hasn't been shipped yet. And then from scan layers three to four to five, blah, 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 the image resolution gets better and better. The additional color information comes in. And somewhere between scan layers seven and nine, the human eye really doesn't notice the difference anymore. It's just decimals coming in. So that it really doesn't matter to the human user experience anymore. What underlies this concept, now I'm going to get a little technical, um, is the way that a JPEG is made up of. So how is a progressive JPEG made? By the way the the, any JPEG encodes its image information. And it does that by a combination of brightness channel, blue channel, and red channel, as you can see here in the example. So you have a barn, the full color image is called ORC. Y is the black and white channel, CB is the blue channel, CR is the red channel. And these three components make up the ORC image. So they basically get overlaid until they form the original image. That is an important bit of information to understand what we're doing here. The second thing that's important is that JPEGs encode their information in a certain way. And how they do this by eight by eight blocks. That's the, how JPEG encoders just work. That means when you have a, a JPEG that is, let's say, 16 by 16, 
you have four blocks that the JPEG encoder touches. So each eight by eight block. So that's how a JPEG encoder processes a JPEG. It goes from bottom, top left to bottom right by eight by eight blocks, parsing over those eight by eight blocks until it has compressed, optimized all the information in the image. And eight by eight, as you all know, is 64. And what you can see here is how the information of 64 pixels in each 8x8 block gets encoded by the JPEG encoder. Because the JPEG encoder, per default, again, this is something we can manipulate, but we shouldn't, um, does not go line by line inside an 8x8 block, but it goes in a zigzag. And that is important to understand the next piece of information. This is how the progressive JPEG a uh, scan layer creation script would look in plain text. This is the default that is shipped with the JPEG standard. And here's the nice thing. It is okay to ship it in plain text. Every JPEG encoder has a flag called scans file. And if you deploy that flag when you invoke your JPEG encoder, you can, you can ship a JPEG, uh, sorry, a plain text file that creates this kind of information, uh, that contains this kind of information. And then the JPEG encoder will understand the information and use that certain script to run its progressive JPEG encoding. And that means we can manipulate how a JPEG should be encoded. Because as you can see here, we have 10, 10 uncommented lines because this is the default script like I've shown you with 10 scan layers. Clear? We have 10 progressive scan layers. This is the script with 10 uncommented lines. So each line is responsible for one of these 10 scan layers. What we see here, like a, um, is a combination of the stuff that I've shown you before. At the beginning, the stuff that is circled in yellow, this are, are commands to which kind of information to deploy. Zero means the uh, brightness channel, uh, one means the red channel, and two means the blue channel. And then the green circles mean which pixels of each 64 pixel matrix to target with each scan layer. And you don't really need to dig into that too deep right now. The slides are online already, and uh, you can read through that in peace and quiet later. But this is just important to understand how that zigzag thing works. So this is basically how the JPEG encoder would create those 10 scan layers. And now, like I said, I have a very funny job. My job is to make things faster. So I sat there at the beginning of the year and thought, Hmm, can I go? Can I make this go faster? And yes, I can because now, by now, I know about the viscera of JPEG encodings. I know about how to manipulate this. And here's how I did it: instead of shipping ten scan layers, I decided that I need fewer scan layers. I wanted five, because I thought this might ship meaningful information to the users sooner. So what I'm doing here is I ship more information per scan layer, which means no more black and white Rhine, no more purple Rhine. Things will look better sooner. That's the idea. And here's the output of that. Now with my manipulated script that I've just shown you, this is the first scan layer. The Rhine is not black and white anymore, and it already has sufficient color information for the user to understand what is being shown. Every user, everybody of you, you might not re see that this is the Rhine, which is completely okay, but you know it's a river, and there are trees in the background, and there are some stones in the front, which is awesome because this is just the first of many scan layers. Now with the second, oh, hold on, the second scan layer, the resolution already looks pretty good, right? Let's go back to number one, a little blurry. But here's number two, and that looks amazing already, considering that in the original with 10 scan layers, we had a purple Rhine which was still pixelated. Now we have a high resolution Rhine which still look, which already looks okay. To be honest, the green in the meadow isn't still okay, but we'll get to that. Scan layer number three, a little more resolution. Scan, number, scan layer number four or five, bam, there's the green that I wanted. And by now, the image looks completely okay. And scan layer number five just deploys a couple of decimals at the, at the end. Nothing important anymore. So this is how progressive JPEGs work. And this is the second important ingredient to the formula I'm showing you today, um, combined with HTTP2's multiplexing. So, these are the two key ingredients, and now you might ask yourself, cool, I've been listening to all of that, but how fast does this make my site? I mean, why, why are you listening if you don't know how fast it is, huh? So, what defines fast? Lots of different answers possible for that, but for my, for my tests, my metrics, I'm going with the speed index. The speed index is a modern web performance metric 
that shows you how the user perceives the initial speed of your site, even if the site isn't fully loaded yet. How does, how does that do it? Um, here you can see the standard definition of the speed index as set in the webpagetest.org official documentation. Here you can see two sites. They both finish loading after 12 seconds, which, to be honest, is a very, very long time. All of our sites shouldn't load in 12 seconds. They should be much faster. But in this test case, both sites, A and B, load in 12 seconds. However, one of the sites shows above the fold content much, much sooner than the other. Um, so much faster, actually, that it gives a much, much better user experience. How fast? This is expressed in the speed index. Speed index uses something uh, akin to milliseconds to express its numbers. So the fast side, the blue side, the side that is perceived as much faster, th appears to be loading in just about a second, while the other one appears to be loading in about nine seconds. Why? Because above the fold content shows much, much faster in our site A than in site B. And that means that the user perceives the site as faster. The site, then as, as you can see, the sites both finish loading at 12 seconds. So at the end of the day, you could argue they're both equally fast, but the user perceives them completely differently. And that is, that is important to how users interact with your site. Because if your users have to wait 10 seconds before anything meaningful renders on their screen, they're gone. The uh, current web performance metrics tell you that the performance dead zone, that means more than 90% bounces, basically zero user interaction is about eight seconds. So if your site loads in eight seconds or more, you are u losing so many users with every load, it's just awful. The golden land of milk and honey where everybody wants to be is one second or a thousand milliseconds because Human computer interaction studies have shown that this is the sweet spot where humans interact with the site most. So we all want our sites to appear loading within one second or less, ideally. And this is what the speed index can tell us. The speed index can tell us, does our site appear to be loading within that one second, yes or no? So here, in this example from webpagetest.org, we could say that the site A loads about 7.5 times faster than site B, which is nice. So now we know what the speed index is. Okay, and now let's have a look at how JPEGs perform if we look at the speed index, so the perceived performance of our sites. First of all, I'm going to create a baseline. That means I'm trying to identify how much better does one JPEG encoding do versus another JPEG encoding without changing anything under the hood. And I, what I'm not changing here is the protocol. So I'm shipping HTTP, uh, I'm using HTTP 1 for this test because it creates a baseline for our future tests. These are tables generated by web page test. And I've circled already in what's important here, the speed index. At the top, you see um, Chrome and Firefox with a window blind effect sequential loading. And at the bottom, you see Chrome and Firefox with a progressive JPEGs, with a pixelated loading that gets better and better. Important, this is, this is the default scan layer, so 10 scan layers. And you can already see that the speed index for progressive JPEGs, even on HTTP 1, so the old protocol, is much better than with uh, sequential JPEGs. Sorry? Mm. I have tested Chrome and Firefox in this case because Chrome and Firefox have slightly different behavior in displaying progressive JPEGs, that's all. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the visual graphs for this. So how do these sites look visually at each second? So at the horizontal, you have the seconds. At the, in the vertical, you have the percentage of, per, of uh, content loaded. And uh, you can see it's a close race, but most of the time, progressive JPEGs outperform. That means they're more to the left and the top, the sequential JPEGs. So sequential JPEGs are, for example, the blue graph, and a progressive JPEG is, for example, the green graph. You can see that it's better most of the time, which is good for us, but we can do better. And here's a video for that. Go video. Yes, go video. Thank you. So at the top, you have sequentially loading images. At the bottom, you have progressively loading images. Again, it's just Chrome and Firefox. You can see that the progressively loading images are already visual. They're, they are to be seen for your users while the others are still loading. 
So the load time is almost identical, but the perceived performance for the ones on the bottom was better than for the ones on the top. Okay, and now we're going to test progressive JPEGs, default scan layers, so 10 scan layers, versus my approach with five scan layers. I'm calling them OP JPEGs, optimized progressive JPEGs, again on the old protocol, HTTP 1. Here is the web page test data for that. You can see that the progressive JPEGs are doing okay, as we've seen in the test before, but the optimized approach whee, is doing much, much better. We win about 130 milliseconds, I think. It's really, really nice. It's a very neat win again. And again, it's just with the old protocol, so just one of the two factors that I'm showing you today. And here's the visual graph for that. You can see the blue line is doing okay, but the red line, the ones with only five scan layers, overtakes it at about 33%. So that means the optimized progressive JPEGs have a higher chance of showing your users meaningful content sooner instead versus the default scan layer process. And here is the video for that. Please press, press play. Cool. Okay, it didn't start at the beginning anyway. So the right hand side is the optimized approach and you can see that it's done by now. And the other one took a little longer. Okay, and now it's getting interesting. So far, we've only been using one of the two key factors I've talked to, to you about, namely optimizing the scan layers. Now we're taking into account a second variable, and that is we're switching to HTTP2's multiplexing. Here's the web page test data for that. We are loading, again, sequential JPEGs, so window blind effect loading JPEGs versus the progressive and standard progressive, node standard progressive. And you can see the result is much clearer already. Why? Because the HTTP2 multiplexing enables your browser to load more of those initial scan layers sooner. So the, browser, the website inside the browser looks more complete sooner to your users. And the graph, as you can see, is more clear now. Progressive JPEGs, even with the 10 scan layers, clearly outperform sequential JPEGs much more clearly than we've shown on HTTP1 with HTTP2, which is awesome. And now let's see how that looks. Video, please. Thank you. So left-hand side, sequential loading, right-hand side, progressive loading, but this time HTTP2. And here we go. Now, Note the uh, load time is even better. So for the HTTP2 version with progressive JPEGs, we now have 3.1 seconds versus 3.3 seconds for the sequential. So now we even have a better onload event for the uh, optimized version, which is also a nice benefit. And now comes into play the recipe that I've been dabbling with for the better half of the first year of 2016 my optimized progressive JPEG approach versus default scan layer approach on HTTP2. Again, this is the web page test data for that. And now things become a little more interesting. You can clearly see that my speed index, which is the metric I'm most interested in, is better for my approach with optimized progressive um, JPEG encoding. However, I also circled in three red circles in the bottom, and that is bad. Red means bad. So why am I doing bad in these scenarios? Because I'm only shipping five scan layers instead of 10, the JPEG encoding algorithm must be less efficient, which means my JPEGs get slightly bigger. As you can see at the very right, you see bytes. You see that it's um, 1.7 max versus 1.8 max of data. That is because the Scan layer, the five scan layer approach for the 20 images in our test site is a little bigger. However, the speed index is better. And this shows that although we are shipping 0.1 megabytes of data more in the lower one than in the top one, the users will still perceive the site as faster because there is more meaningful content being shown. So I say that this approach is totally worth it. Here's the visual graph for that. So you can see now, like I said, the results become a little more interesting. At the beginning, the standard approach wins out. Why? Because the initial scan layers are a little lighter, because they have less data per scan layer to, to deliver. But about after 25%, my approach of, progressive, of optimized progressive JPEGs outperforms the default approach. 
because now more meaningful content is being delivered sooner. You can see that the graph for the optimized approach, the red one, basically goes vertically up after the 25% mark and then outperforms the default approach, which is pretty amazing. All of all, of all so I've tested this in various scenarios and try to gain a median of median result. I can safely assume that the optimized progressive scan layer approach saves about 6% of speed index on top of everything else you can do to JPEGs today. So that's a huge gain again. And that is how I ended my, um, how my research in, I think, May 2016, which was a couple of weeks before I had to go to Velocity Santa Clara in the US to present this. And one of my colleagues who is freakishly smart, he basically tapped me on the shoulder and said like, mm, that's all very interesting, Tobias, but have you considered also using HTTP server, HTTP2 server push for that? And I was like, no, should I? And he's like, yeah, you should have. So I was like, damn. So four weeks later and lots of research more, I've also tested this with HTTP2 server push. Now, what is HTTP2 server push? This is what I've shown to you in the beginning, taking control of the priority tree for our asset delivery. That means we can now have our HTTP2 enabled server tell the browser which assets are important. And I've been using a hacky hacky web server for my tests, which is called Shimmercat. And in Shimmercat, you can define the priority for each asset with a get parameter, which is nasty, but for my tests, it was working well enough. So don't use this in production. It was just fun to test with. Um, if the uh, value here is zero, this means highest, highest, highest priority. If the value is 500, it means low priority and the values accumulate. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting the metadata of each JPEG, so the information for the JPEG, how big it is, plus the first scan layer to the highest priority. And then the other scan layers become a cascade of decreasing priority. So my HTTP2 enabled web server now tells a browser, hey browser, you might not have requested this JPEG, but you have to take this metadata and this initial scan layer into account anyway. So there is no more browser requesting the JPEG. The server is now pushing the JPEG information into the browser without the browser having even requested it. So we now have server push enabled. And this is how that goes. So here's a comparison for all the encoding processes so far, uh, side by side, and all on HTTP2, obviously. So we've got baseline sequential JPEGs, the window blind effect JPEGs at the top, and I've circled them red because they're loading like crap. The progressive JPEGs with 10 default scan layers are circled in orange because they load faster than the sequential ones, but they still don't load fast enough. The optimized progressive JPEGs with only five scan layers and on HTTP2's multiplexing are circled in yellow because they're as fast as we have been so far but now I can even go faster with server push, and that's the result at the bottom. You can see that there's a difference of 1,200 milliseconds between sequential JPEGs and server push optimized progressive, which is amazing. So we've basically cut page load time in half just by all of this, just by doing all of this to JPEG data. That is a pretty amazing result. And clickety-click, here's the visual graph for that. And again, like I said, things are a little more interesting. At the beginning, the default approaches start loading a little sooner because the initial scan layer is a little lighter. But after that magical 25% mark, things become very, very interesting because you can see vertical lines shooting up because the initial, uh, the optimized progressive scan layer approach powered by HTTP2 server push outperforms everything else. You can see that in the, in the green line here. The green line starts off, meh, okay, but after 25%, it just goes through the roof, which means far more data, far more visual data is shown to the user much, much sooner. And last but not least, the video for that. So from top, right to bottom, from top left to bottom right, keep the bottom right in your eyes because that's the fastest. See how fast the bottom right is going? Bam, it's almost done. That is so cool, and now it's done and the rest is just boring. Look at that. So the bottom right is just so cool, outperformed everything we've seen so far. See, now the rest is done. That was like half of, like, of the rest. So 
optimized progressive JPEGs with HTTP2's multiplexing plus server push have outperformed everything we've seen so far. And now I have been approached by people who say, yeah, but progressive JPEGs are bad for performance because they use up more CPU cycles. The funny thing is that used to be true and it's still true, but it really doesn't matter anymore. So the argument about progressive JPEGs in general being a bad idea is because the browser CPU is, power, is used a little more because it has to process the scan layers 10 times or five times, while it only has to do this once for the sequentials. You can see the CPU graph here. And the thing is, in modern computing with our current smartphone power, this really doesn't matter anymore. Let's do another poll here. Who has bought their cell phone in the last three years? Okay, let me ask this again. Who has bought their cell phone in the last three years or less? I'm sorry, let's do this a little more clearly. All right, the last four years or less. Okay, so that's basically like about 75% of the room by now, that's nice. So the argument about CPU time is as old as JPEG encoding, so like 20 years, doesn't really matter anymore. With our powerful devices, even with a broken iPhone 4 like mine, progressive JPEGs are completely okay to deploy. You can see in the CPU graph that the optimized progressive JPEG approach with server push costs the least CPU cycles of all the progressive approaches. So it's even worth doing that for the CPU cycles. But again, if somebody in your development teams argues that a progressive JPEG is not worth it because of CPU cycles, it's an out, outdated argument. Don't go for that anymore. So I'm now basically done. Let's take, it's takeaway time. So what have we learned today? First of all, Progressive images on HTTP2 are awesome. They are really, really fast. They're an immediate win because more, more image data is shown to your users sooner. That's very, very important for your user experience and your conversion rate if you do e-commerce. sorry. Scan layer manipulation. So instead of shipping 10 scan layers, shipping five scan layers gives you a better speed index all overall. So that's a gain you can get for your website, no matter what else you do to your images. An HTTP2 server push with optimized scan layers is just awesome sauce. It's the fastest we can be. We have basically halved page load time with this recipe. This is so fast, it's mind blowing. Your users will really appreciate that. So that's me, thank you very much. And again, if you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter, write an email, and I'll be here all day. Thank you so much. Thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question. Have you considered a new Dropbox lepton encoder? They uh, said in their blog post that they can reduce the size of already optimized JPEGs by uh, one third, by 33%, if I'm right. I'm sorry, could you Drop, a, a new codec for yes. JPEG named lepton Lepton from Dropbox. Oh, oh, oh uh, this one, yeah. I've, I've read about it. I read the white paper. It's for JPEG storage, though, not for JPEG uh, display. So you can, you can make the images smaller if you want to store them somewhere like Dropbox or Google Cloud. But they are not standard JPEGs anymore, which means if you push them to a website, they can't be displayed anymore. They would break. So the, 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 the Dropbox approach is awesome for storing your images on the cloud but you have to decode them again before deploying them to the web. Ah, okay, I understand. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hello, hey. thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, type of uh, images we can use. So uh, do uh, we should use only progressive JPEGs or is there any other kind of optimization, maybe for SVG or other types? So uh, image formats are very, very difficult, and the question is difficult. So thank you for a difficult question. <laughs> um, so uh, I've talked a little bit about it. There, there is WebP for everything that is Blink-based, so Chrome and Opera. Um, and WebP ha has been actively developed. So uh, while in 2012 WebP wasn't 
as good as we hoped it would be. It had problems. Facebook actually moved to WebP and then away from WebP because everybody hated it back then. Um, it got glossy faces on people's Facebook photographs. And so people were like, ah, what's that Facebook? What are you doing? Throw that away. So they went back to JPEG and started funding Mods JPEG. Um, WebP has been developed by, by then, and Google has kept WebP up to date and it has gotten better. So WebP is still a force to be reckoned with. Also, um, Firefox has an intent to implement, I think. So uh, the Gecko engine will get, oh no, now it's called Server, right? Server will get WebP support sometime in the future. So I think in one or two years, we will have to deal with WebP even more. Other approaches like uh, JPEG XR for Microsoft, I don't really believe in that much because they are, when they were created, they were meant for HDR images and uh, high resolution images, not so much for highly performant images. So they're not that great on the browser. They are okay, but they're not that great. Then there are very, very, very out there algorithms like FL, FLIF and BGP. Um, they are not standardized, and the only way you could use them in a browser like right now is with a JavaScript-based polyfill, which you really shouldn't do because it doesn't perform yet. Um, but the algorithms that they use are very interesting. Um, what you could use, of course, for images that are smaller and have less colors is PNG. So PNG is completely safe and is supported by every browser. And a quick win, for example, is using PNG 8 plus full alpha transparency. A lot of people don't know that PNG8, with its only 256 colors, can use full alpha channel. So they think PNG8 is like GIF. It can only do 100% transparency or no transparency at all. But that's not true. With the right PNG encoder, you can actually use full alpha transparency. That means semi-transparency, like a glass bottle with something in behind. So you can get images really, really small. Um, Cornel Lezinski, which is like the most awesome guru of image optimization ever, he has actually written a J uh, PNG encoder for that, which is called PNG Quant. And what that does is it takes a PNG 24 image and uh, gives it back as a PNG 8 with full alpha transparency support. And that roughly gives you about 72% byte size gain on the PNG image. Well, every browser out there supports this. So that's really, really an awesome win. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. Hey, uh, hey, my question is about, uh, it, have, it has more ac academical perspective. I imagine that someone sets uh, progressive JPEG as a CSS background. Mm -hmm. And uh, do uh, modern browsers recognize it uh, properly? And what comes, uh, what is about the appearance? How do users see these images when they have been set at CSS background? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very interesting question and very good. It ties into the prior priority tree that I mentioned. Usually, when a browser approaches an image inside a CSS, its priority is less as if the image was linked directly. So if the image was linked directly in the HTML file, its priority for most browsers it would be higher as if it was linked as a background in CSS. That means images inside CSS would load later than as if they were linked directly. However, with HTTP2's uh, server push, you can get around that problem because the browser doesn't need to request the image anymore. You can push the image into the browser without the browser having to request it at all. So you could get the same effect as long as you use HTTP2 server push. Sure. You said that when uh, we have 10 scan layers, uh, user doesn't notice the difference between 7 and 10. And uh, by this time, uh, you have experienced the 5 scan layers. And at what point user doesn't notice the difference? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, interesting question. Uh, I would have to test a lot. But uh, to give a proper answer, the simple answer would be it depends on the image content. So if you have, say, a image with somebody wearing a completely red dress, like maybe this pullover, what you would see is that with red, certain information of the red channel mm -hmm. is, comes in at another scan layer than if the pullover was completely blue. Mm. So that de really depends on color contents inside each image. Mm -hmm. uh, one more. Uh, <laughs> uh, number five, five scan layers. Uh, what about four scan layers? 
Uh, oh, you mean manipulate them for four, yeah. I mean four scaling layers? Uh, I haven't found a way to get lower than five. Mm -hmm. um, it, I don't, I'm not sure if it's mathematically possible. I think, yeah, oh no, it would be possible. I think four is possible, but the scan layers might become too big. Mm -hmm. So that means that um, they get delayed. So if, I mean, uh, to be honest, to, have to, to verify this, I would have to run a data set of maybe a million JPEGs and find the median, the perfect median result for the optimized script for a million JPEGs. I haven't done that. What I have done is manual testing, and of course, as you know, manual testing takes a long time. So I've tested this on, I don't know, 60, 80 JPEGs by now. And the script that I've shown you, the optimized script with five scan layers, is the best I could come up with for this small data set. If I would test this on a large set, I might come up with an even better algorithm. But these five scanners that I've shown you give you a good median result between performance and uh, size. So if you go with four scan layers, the JPEG encoder might become so inefficient that the JPEG becomes so big that it actually loads longer. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a trade-off. So less scan layers, bigger file size, more scan layers, smaller file size, but worse user experience. So you need to balance the scales. And one more, please. It really interests me. We have a big one image, and we have uh, more thumbnails. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you uh, notice the difference when it comes to a uh, big JPEG yes. or uh, little thumbnails? Uh, user appearance from that yes. perspective. So um, for a, so a um, the fewer images you have at the top the less important this experience is. Because, like I said, the speed index calculates what is visible above the fold, so without the user having scrolled. If you have a huge hero image, like my face there, for example, on the web page, that, that means that this is the only image visible to the user at the beginning. So if this is the only image that's loading, the effect is less pronounced. If you have 20 thumbnails, like my test page had, then the effect is very, very big. So um, for a big hero image, my personal recommendation would be to create what is called an LKIP, a low quality image placeholder. That means either um, define the primary colors for the image that's loading inside CSS as CSS backgrounds. So um, you know that gradients can, CSS gradients can take variable, multiple steps. So a gradient in CSS is not just one color to another color, but it can take steps. So what you could do is you could um, try to approximate the, uh, the average color flow of the image inside a CSS multi-step gradient and deploy that as the placeholder until the image has loaded. Um, Guy Pojami, a city of Akamai, has invented LKIP. That means that is a technique where you use a, say, 200 byte size image and upscale that with Gaussian blur. Then that means that you load that image, and then when this image has loaded, and the high-resolution image has loaded in the background, use JavaScript to switch them out. That's another technique to deal with hero images. You're welcome. If you have any more questions, find me here. Cool. Let's thank our speaker, and in a few minutes, we are ready to commence.